Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning is our gospel lesson from Luke chapter 16. Before the sermon, I'll just reread verses 22 and 23 where Jesus says, The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So far, our text, in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth, dear Christian friends, I wonder if perhaps one of the reasons we as Americans love watching sports so much is because we are able to see people do things that we aren't allowed to do. Certainly we see them doing some things we're not able to do. They have particular skills that we don't have in throwing a ball or, or what have you. But we're also not allowed to do certain things that they are allowed to do in the context of their sport. You turn on the NASCAR race today and you'll see people driving 180 miles per hour. We aren't allowed to do that. Please don't try that. I'm not saying we could get our minivan up to 180 miles an hour even if we wanted to. You see a defensive player sacking the quarterback. You, at your job, can't take a running start at another, department, another department's head at your company and knock them over if you want at work. You, you just can't do that. You'll probably be fired. You see two people in hockey or in boxing fighting each other, slugging it out. You and I can't and ought not to do that. We, if, if we do, we, we run the risk of being arrested. It's illegal. In the context of the sport, it's okay. There's a time and a place for that sort of thing, and then there's a time and a place where you ought not to do that thing. Well, you know that, that the writer of the, of the book of Ecclesiastes, King Solomon, wrote, there is a time for everything and so on, a time for war, a time for peace, and so on. There is a time, Jesus points out in the parable of the rich man and poor Lazarus, there's a time for fighting the fight of faith. There is a time to engage in that real fight. There's a time and a place for that fight. The place is here on planet Earth. The time is while we live on planet Earth. There will come a time when we aren't able to engage in that kind of fight anymore because there will be no more fight to be fought. That time is when we are taken away from this world. While we live here on Earth, though, it is time to fight. Fight the fight of faith while there is time to fight. In the parable of the rich man and poor Lazarus, obviously the central figures are the rich man and poor Lazarus. They both die seemingly at about the same time. Lazarus is taken to heaven the rich man ends up in hell. And I would challenge you, as you think about the particulars of this text, to come up with a reason why the rich man was sent to hell according to what's listed for us there about the rich man. We're told that he dressed very well and he lived in luxury every day of his life. And that's really it. He went to hell. Does that mean that dressing in nice clothes and living in luxury condemns a person to hell? Of course not. We know of wealthy people who were true believers and sometimes even used their wealth to support gospel ministry. The Apostle Paul, the writer of our second lesson, we're going to refer to their second lesson later today too, uh, was supported by scores of wealthy people and he mentions them in his epistles as examples of faith. It is not a sin to be wealthy. It's not a sin to live comfortably and in luxury. There's only one sin, ultimately, that condemns a person to hell. And that's the sin of unbelief. Though it isn't spelled out for us clearly, because the rich man went to hell, we have to say he was an unbeliever. And that's kind of uh, uh, kind of striking, too, when you see what he says when he sees Abraham and Lazarus in heaven and calls out to them in the parable. He says, Father Abraham. If he's saying Father Abraham, that, that's an expression that Jewish people used. This was a man who was raised to know the true God. 
What happened? Our second lesson sheds a little light on that. When the Apostle Paul is warning Timothy about the danger of seeking after riches, he mentions many people eager for money have left the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. That's what happened to this rich man. Somehow, somewhere along the way, he left the faith because being rich was more important to him. Being comfortable was more important to him. He left the faith. It wasn't stolen from him. He gave it away. He traded it for worldly wealth. And as such, he got exactly what he wanted out of the bargain. He got a life of luxury here on earth. Again, it's not a sin to be rich. It's not a sin to have comforts in this life. Little luxuries here and there, too, that we all enjoy. Those aren't sinful. But to pursue these things above all else, to structure our lives so that the pursuit of these things, the acquisition of these things, and the maintenance of these things is the most important thing in our lives, that is sinful. And it is very dangerous. The Apostle Paul goes on, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. We can only imagine what sorts of evil this man might have perpetuated in order to stay rich. One such evil is hinted at in our text. There was the beggar Lazarus. The beggar Lazarus was laid at the gate of the rich man. And it doesn't appear the rich man did anything for him because Lazarus' hunger was never sated. Lazarus's wounds were never taken care of. It doesn't appear that the beggar at the gate received anything from this rich man. Oh, his friends probably loved him. His brothers probably loved him and mourned him when he passed. But ultimately, he was condemned to hell. And he was condemned to hell. He gave away his faith because he didn't feel like fighting for it. Fight the fight of faith while there's still time to fight. Again, we can only suppose what sort of fight this rich man was called upon by God to put up. Would he have had to give up some of his riches in order to maintain his faith? If so, that was a fight he wasn't willing to fight. And let's be honest, too. We have structured our individual lives so often so that they are about being comfortable in this world. And sometimes, although we are called to fight the fight of faith, sometimes we would rather not fight. If that fight is against a particular temptation, a temptation of desire, it's easier to give in to the desire, whatever that desire is for, than to fight against the temptation. If a temptation that we are called to fight against is a temptation of self-denial or stepping outside of our comfort zone to worry less about ourselves and to worry more about the people that God has brought into our lives, but we would rather think about ourselves. Well, that is, in, in its essence, the same sin as the rich man. The rich man's sin. On the other hand, you have Lazarus. Lazarus went to heaven. Did Lazarus go to heaven because he was poor? Of course not. There is no inherent nobility in being poor. But Lazarus fought the fight of faith. And when I say Lazarus fought the fight of faith, that's not to say that Lazarus woke up every morning and said, oh boy, I love my life. What a wonderful day this is. Because Lazarus' life was a bad life. Our parable says as much. He received only bad things. Lazarus was hungry. Lazarus was hungry in a way that you and I have seldom, if ever, been hungry. So hungry that he longed to just be underneath the table of the rich man so he could lick up a few of the crumbs that might fall on the floor. Lazarus was in pain, constant pain because of sores. And the only temporary relief he, really, he got from that pain was when dogs, wild dogs, would come up to him and lick him. What a pathetic life. Certainly, he didn't accomplish in his life the things that the world might say the rich man accomplished. But Lazarus fought the fight of faith. Now, Lazarus fought 
the internal battle against temptation that was unique to his life. The rich man was not willing to fight. Lazarus was. And Lazarus's fight certainly was different than the rich man's. The rich man's would have been a fight against completely immersing himself in the luxuries of this world, ignoring God's word, and the rich man did not fight. Lazarus fought. He fought the temptation to look at his miserable life and say, God, what good are you? You haven't done anything for me. Instead, Lazarus repented of this sin and all of his sins and received eternal life. He fought the fight of faith. Now, there are so many truths that, that, that this parable teaches us. And one of those truths is something that we have to talk about, something that we started talking to the kids about a few minutes ago, and that's the truth of death. We've structured our lives not only around worldly comfort sometimes, but also to help us ignore the truth of death, right? Right? How many of you enjoyed a chicken sandwich or a hamburger lately? Hmm, who hasn't? Delicious. Chicken sandwiches, hamburgers, hot dogs. How much thought do we put into the death of the animals that became our chicken sandwiches, our hot dogs, or our hamburgers? Probably not much. But whatever kind of meat we're eating, there had to be some death involved. But we don't want to think about that. You know, it was different in generations past. When people raised their own chickens, for instance, and dad would take the kids out, and they'd learn something about life then. Stretch the chicken's neck out over the tree stump and so on. Eh, when I brought this up on Thursday night, I kind of mistakenly talked about the father bringing the son out when one kind lady, a member of ours, said, you know, it was my job to kill the chickens, so I have to say sons and daughters too. Certainly not gender specific. And though I haven't done that myself, and I wasn't raised as a farmer, my my, my father was, and from what I've heard, this this was not a time for joking around when, when you butchered an animal for the dinner table. It was a solemn time, in a sense. You knew where that meat was coming from because you knew there was death involved. So too... Let us not structure our lives either, thinking that somehow we live without an expiration date on us because we do. This isn't fun to talk about, but it has to be talked about. We are all going to die. Unless Jesus comes back soon, we are all going to die. And as our parable points out, there are one of two places that people go when they die. Death is something to be prepared for. And I'm not talking about prepaying the funeral home so that everything goes well for the service. I'm talking about where we spend eternity. It is only unbelief that condemns a person to eternal death. It is only faith in Jesus Christ that allows a person to enter that eternal life. And and look how Lazarus enters eternal life. There's a wonderful message for us there too. Think of what God's angels are called to do. God's angels are are, are those beings that protect us in so many ways. We'll never know till we get to heaven how many times the angels have stepped in to protect us from something or other. In the Old Testament and in the New Testament, we do see God's angels delivering messages from God to people. But here's another work of the angels that maybe we don't think about a whole lot. When it is time For a believer to cease living in this life and to go to heaven, God sends his angels to escort their souls from earth to heaven. What a beautiful parade each believer gets as the soul is escorted from earth to heaven. Maybe you've been in the presence of a loved one as they departed this life. And whether you saw them or not, If they died in faith, the angels were there to escort their souls from earth to heaven. And somewhere on God's heavenly schedule, 
There is an appointment for angels to carry your soul home to heaven as well. So fight the fight of faith. Remember, because those angels are coming not because you fight the fight of faith, but you fight the fight of faith because you know those angels are coming for you. Remember, it says fight the fight of faith. It doesn't say win the fight of faith. Because you and I can't win the fight of faith. There are times God calls us to stand firm in faith, to resist temptation, to speak out boldly, and we fail to do these things. But you know, sometimes we do do these things. And we do stand firm in faith, and we do speak out against temptation, we do speak boldly. Sometimes. If you are feeling a struggle inside of yourself, if you are feeling guilt because of times that you haven't either successfully or industriously fought the fight of faith. Remember, it isn't about winning that fight of faith. It's just fighting the fight of faith because in all truth, the fight of faith has already been won. Jesus won it for you. Jesus' victory is your victory through faith. And as a sign of your victory, you have been marked and claimed as God's own child, destined for heaven, and the angels are going to come home, come to take you home. So fight the fight of faith. Sometimes you're going to win that fight, and sometimes you're going to lose that fight. But it isn't about whether you win or lose, it's the fact that you are fighting. In fighting, you show that you have that new creation inside of you. In fighting, you show that you know that your Savior has already won for you and you are giving thanks by engaging in the struggle yourself. And you can look forward to the time when there will be no more fight because those angels, God's holy angels, are coming for you. Amen. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.